art of hatred, uh, the limits of humanity and violence in Soviet wartime culture. Um, one of the most striking features of Soviet culture during the Great Patriotic War, and especially the, uh, of the first phase of it, was a clear departure from the ideological and visual sterility of pre-war art. Before the war, any depiction of violence, suffering, death, or victimization had been practically taboo. The disastrous beginning of the war for the Soviet Union and the German atrocities both brought about major changes to Soviet ideology. The focus of my paper of this presentation will be the retuning of Soviet art according to this new ideological doctrine. This translation of ideology into literature, first of all poetry and journalism, and music was followed by visual arts such as poster, painting, and film, completely changing their narrative, style, and tune. The war rapidly changed the optics of Soviet art. Before the war, it had for many people been a purely ritualized phenomenon. But now, the regime's problem suddenly became a personal matter for everyone, a question of one's own blood, of life and death. Artistic strategy was narrowed down, focusing on a maximum effort to bring political measures on a level with mass perception. This drastically increased the mobilizational potential of art. As early as in autumn of 1941, an intense internal restructuring of Soviet ideology was already um, underway. In September of 1941, one could still hear assertions like this, and I quote, in the mobilization of the masses, of the people for the fight against Hitler's hordes, the deciding role belongs to the Bolshevik party, or, the quote, the great comrade Stalin and the party organizers are the inspiration for military feats on the fronts and the working, uh, working masses enthusiasm on the home front and the organizers of both, end quote. But already a different ideological line was clearly perceptible. It was formulated by Central Committee uh, Secretary Alexander Sherbakov. He was a secretary on um, ideology. After he died, um, Zdanov Zdan was appointed as a uh, secretary responsible for ideology. It was at the end of war. But this is a, a 1941. Um, and I quote Sherbakov. Our propaganda and agitation must in every way possible spell out the nationwide patriotic nature of the war against the German invaders to the very broadest masses. The key words here are uh, no longer the party, but uh, they are propaganda, patriotic, and journalists. But this new line differed in character as well as in content. It was the new character of the humanized wartime ideology, which was manifested in Stalin's very first words that he addressed to the masses after the start of the war, in his very form of his famous first address, brothers and sisters. This was the new voice of the regime, which appealed to the masses directly and swept aside the institutional barriers and ritualized ideological conventions. Before our very eyes, an abrupt humanization of Soviet art takes place, as well as an intensive humanization of ideology itself. For a short while, 
ideology loses its doctrinaire nature and its aesthetic formulation changes beyond recognition. The only well-established practice that ideology continued to resort to uh, was historicization. That was something that came from, uh, from pre-war uh, Soviet art, Soviet culture. The first and perhaps most famous wartime posters were the mother, uh, the mother, uh, motherland, mother is calling you, Rodina Mike Zavod, and our forces are innumerable. Наши силы неисчислимы. The first one, the first one, the, this one, appeals to the maternal archetype. And the se uh, second one to triumphant Russian history. Um, as you see, of course, this Minin and Pajarsky, so this historical uh, assemblage is quite clear. Uh, in his speech, uh, 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 made, very famous speech, made on November 6, 1941, for the 21st anniversary of the October Revolution, that the famous one that he gave at the Red Square, um, Stalin touched upon uh, the theme of national pride, uh, of figures from the, as he said, great Russian nation. As he put it, this was, and I quote, the nation of Plekhanov and Lenin, Belinsky and Chernyshevsky, Pushkin and Tolstoy, Glinka and Tchaikovsky, Gorky and Chekhov, Sechinov and Pavlov, Repin and Surikov, and of Kutuzov and Suvorov. The following day, he made a send-off speech on Red Square, the, 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 the first one was in Kremlin, the second one on 7th of November, on the Red Square, for the troops leaving to defend Moscow. In the conclusion of it, he said, and I quote, let, let your inspiration in this war be the courageous image of our great ancestors, Alexander Nevsky, Dmitry Donskoy, Kuzma Minin, Dmitry Pazarsky, Alexander Sovorov, and Mikhail Kutuzov, end quote. At first, this historicization had been tied to an epic past, and Soviet soldiers were compared to bogaters, legendary characters legendary characters of Russian epic folk tales. But after a very short time, the association were linked to the quite specific victorious ideal of Russian nation. Commanders and um, a great Russian glorian, glorious imperial past. Suvorov, Kutuzov, and Alexander Nevsky. What is quite obvious here is that this assemblage of names does not include a single one that could be even remotely associated with Soviet era. It is pre-revolutionary canon of heroes through and through. The irony is that at the quarter century anniversary of proletarian revolution approached and to which Stalin's speeches had in fact been dedicated, the revolution was apparently skipped, historically irrelevant. We should remember, however, that these images had been brought to life in Soviet art on the eve of the war. In Eisenstein's film, Alexander Nevsky, for example, the historical allusions and references to fascist Germany were so transparent that even uh, Mitre of the Teutonic Knights bishop was decorated with swastikas. Look at this. <laughs> the main thing, though, was that a specifically Soviet historical film and novel of uh, pre-war period which both had their real heyday on the eve of the war, both directly addressed the darker side of reality. Pre-war socialist realism, after all, 
simply did not know how to depict suffering and death. On the contrary, 1930s Soviet art had created an atmosphere of joy, happiness, and the abundance of life. The events in it, in it had frequent, frequently unfolded in a holiday setting, one of relaxation. In the art, people sang, danced, and played. On the images and films that dealt with a world of the past had portrayals of a brutal reality. Alexander Nevsky, for example, is saturated with violence. In this film, people are raped, cut off heads, and throw children into the fire. Well, these quite famous images from Alexander Nevsky. There is a similar similarity between the humanized stylistics of Soviet wartime culture and pre-war ideology in the mobilizational functions of both. Um, uh, but the differences are far, for, far more significant. Pre-war ideology appealed to rationality, uh, utopian as it might have been. Wartime culture, almost primal activistic instincts like hate and vengeance. vengeance. In order to call this forth, the culture had to resort to a peculiar sort of imagery. Painting horrible pictures of death and destruction became a characteristic artistic strategy of the war. The efficacy of this imagery was, of course, reinforced by institutions of the Soviet regime, by the activities of NKVD, Smersh, military offenders, battalions, tribunals, and uh, 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 concentration camps. In, practicality, in, uh, um, in practically all of the uh, party documents dealing with the matters of the press, uh, there was a demand to issue as much material as possible, and I quote, about the atrocities of German fascist monsters in the areas that they have temporarily uh, captured, about the pillaging and devastation of our cities and villages, about the violence inflicted on women and children, end quote. Another topic was, and I quote, the tortures of Hitler's black guards uh, of wounded uh, Red Army men held captive. Uh, there were to be materials about the despicable bandit activities of German soldiers and officers, the simply written stories of uh, witnesses uh, to the atrocities of the fascist invaders were to be printed. Uh, party organizers were required to, and I quote, uh, extensively use the facts of the bloody crimes of the German fascist aggressors in education and propaganda work, made these crimes of the uh, occupiers known to the entire population in lie and light the fires of hatred uh, for the enemy in the masses." End quote. War correspondents were obliged to shed light on, and I quote, the atrocities perpetrated by the German fascist aggressors, the pillaging and rape of the civil population uh, of, the, of the areas they have occupied, and the Germans' extermination of uh, Soviet prisoners of war." End quote. Of course, very few people, only those in the front lines of the war, could only see what was happening. But the aim was to convey horrible scenes of the war by, uh, by means of imagery. Um, that is, by directly depicting them. Let's turn to a typical vivid document. It is a headline story in the main party journal, Bolshevik, uh, published during the most acute period of the war, early August 1942, uh, on the eve of the Battle of Stalingrad. It was titled, We Will Embody Hatred of the Enemy in Real Acts of War. And it begins with these images, and I quote, Cities turned into ruins, villages burned to the ground, 
giblets with, with the corpse of peaceful Soviet people swinging in the wind. West pits full of, of the dream with the bodies of people tortured and executed. Women and children wandering like shadows among the ruins. And this was, however, the visual part. What followed was tension building, at the first on the, on the verbal level, and I quote, the human imagination simply cannot imagine the monstrous tortures to which the Germans are subjected, subjecting the Soviet people. This is further intensified by adding color to the original sketch. This latter process, however, proceeds in stages. First, photographs found with German soldiers are shown. On the photographs, a quote, a mob of Fritzes with diabolic smiles standing in front of a Russian village being burned down. Another one has German soldiery with a group of peaceful Soviet locals who were executed. With the next photograph, the tension is increased with uh, amplifi amplified eroticism. And I quote, a German man stripped to the waist lashes a naked girl, end quote. Following these are quotes from German soldiers and officers' letters about the preeminence, supremacy, and rights of the su superior German race. After this, the storytelling by witnesses of the scenes of violence begin, begins. The, uh, the slogans that um, came after these uh, images, such as uh, we will rain down our wrath upon the aggressors' heads and the like. We're deliberately redundant. Obviously, they pale in comparison with these horrible images. Before our very eyes, the regime has stopped speaking in slogans and started telling story through, stories through images. Thus, a tautology arises. The slogan loses its meaning. A merger of the image and the slogan takes place, and one turns into the other. The image mobilizes and challenges like a slogan, and the slogan adds pain like a picture. So this very peculiar change of uh, visual and verbal um, uh, uh, techniques takes a consistent rejection of decorative style occurs in wartime art. As everyone knows, decorative style is, a, is the opposite of narrative in general. Narrative in turn in terms is the opposite of expressionism. Soviet art in wartime unexpectedly ended up in a completely new aesthetic dimension. If before, if, if before the war, socialist realism had been narrative immersed in, in decorative style, then during the war, the art that arose might be called socialist expressionism, violent in content and naturalistic in form. But depicting Soviet prosperous life before the war, the Soviet artist, ignoring the viewer, believed that the image of plentiful harvest will turn into real abundance. Now, by depicting German atrocities, Soviet art appealed directly to the viewer, aiming to translate the image into an action. Um, so, the nature of the image here is purely functional, and it worked. For us, of course, images of horrors and violence, both real and imagined, Images of the terror and death that are taking place in different parts of the world have become part of everyday life, thanks to television and the internet. Mass murders and wars are perceived as ordinary phenomena. Images of pain and suffering, are not necessarily you know, as a result of wars, but even horrible disasters that we all witnessed, you know, this uh, 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 on Philippines 
today on, on TV and internet. It's horrible images, right? Um, um, uh, images of pain and suffering had become an important aspect of contemporary mass media, from political propaganda to commercial uh, advertisement, and are absolutely interchangeable. But they had a completely different effect on people in 1940s. Graphic violence was the most powerful tranquilizer, called upon to quell fear, personal doubts, and concerns. Death, hardship, and the horror of war, by bringing individual experience out onto the surface of collective action, transferred the effects of the self into the stereotype of mass behavior. Soviet wartime culture did not, of course, cease to be the Soviet. Uh, it continued telling the stories of miracle and unparalleled feats, but this is not what uh, determined its distinctiveness. What was new was the means itself of conveying this heroism. One example is particularly telling. Zoya Kosmatimyanska was a heroic partisan who was captured by the Germans and him. The mythology of this image is enormous. Paintings, epic poems, a novel, memoirs, and film. But it all began in 1942 when the newspaper Pravda published the journalist Sergei Strunnikov's shocking photograph of Kosmodemyanska after she was hanged. Her body is pressed into the show, snow in the snapshot. What was new and shocking was the closeness of the camera to the victims. Owing to this, the viewer was drawn directly into the event and consequently uh, could not distance himself or herself from the horror of the death. This unaccustomed closeness to reality evoked horror and at the same time a sort of trance. Despite the state of shock, to which this image subjected viewers, they could not tear themselves away from it. This photograph undoubtedly departed from the depictive tradition of socialist realism, in which women as heroines were presented either in the, for, uh, in the form of fighters or in the form of mothers. Vividly expresses, this photograph vividly expresses both heroic motifs and characteristic of socialist realism and the characteristic Christian religious motifs. Another thing that sets the photograph of Zoya apart for, uh, is an unusual sensuality. The hat thrown back, the neck stretched back, and the uh, uh, bare breasts that evoke association with Delacroix's liberty. In Stalinist culture, only the depiction of a dead woman could contain such a powerful erotic component. This phenomenon has, of course, its own cultural parallels. In English Victorian era painting, the public depiction of eroticism was limited to the dead female body. Of course, partially nude bodies figured also in pre-war Soviet photography. They were, however, limited to two public spheres, war and sports. However, the images of the nude body, owing to the specific Soviet optics, were deprived of eroticism by virtue of the fact that, um, um, virtue of the fact that, that, that the images of the beautiful bodies of young sportsmen and uh, sportswomen and young female and male workers lacked any individualization. But in Zoya's photograph, the main thing is the uh, individualization of, the de of her death and suffering. What the viewer was unaccustomed of seeing, unaccustomed of seeing were the details that bore witness to the painful death 
of young girl who had become the victim of violence, uh, the bare breast uh, of which uh, the things, uh, a signs of torture are, are visible, and the uh, news tighten around her neck. The female breasts here are perceived as a part of the body that was, against the victim's will, laid bare to public view. Hence, they create a feeling of helplessness that is especially touching to the viewer. It is worth noting that the photographs were por uh, rotated in Pravda. So, so, as you see, these two photographs, uh, this one uh, on the right, so on the left, left side, no, left, left side. Um, in such way that the image of tortured girl body was more, more fully exposed to the viewer. Filmmaker Lev Arnstrom recreated this blend of eroticism and religiously exalted imagery in his 1944 film Zoya. Zoya, whose role is played by actress Galina Verbitskaya, is transformed here into a virginal creation, uh, an uh, irreproachable, sexless beauty, uh, with whom both men and women can, to different degree, identify. The whole aesthetic of the film, which is restrained in its impressionist manner, is subordinated to this. In the scene where Zoya Zoya's final journey is shown as she walks at night in the snow towards her death. The viewer sees first her bare feet, her thin legs, and then the vague outline of her body that emerges through the heavy snowfall. Only then does her inspired radiant face appears on the screen. Um, a few weeks after the photographs was published in Pravda, the very famous caricature artist, Kukrinix, you know, the group of, of, of artists, um, um, went to the village of Petrishchevo uh, in Moscow region, um, where the execution took place, and afterwards uh, created their painting in 94, same year, their painting, The Feet of Zoya Kosmetimianska, Podvig Zoya Kosmetimianska, 1943, the same year. One needs only to compare the post execution photograph and with the Kukrinik's painting to understand how significant the role of the close up camera is. As soon as the optics are changed, the horror degrades into heroism, and the painting fails to touch the viewer. As we see, the heroic uh, 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 stage at the front of it, and the tortured victim are quite different. And not only, uh, you know, not only just as, as, a, as a visual thing, but, but in its effect, in its function, of course. Function is quite different. Ilya Ehrenburg wrote, and I quote, War is frenzy, the heat of hatred and self-abandonment. War without hatred is a war. Like cohabition without love is. When I say frenzy, I am not, of course, thinking about hysterics, affectation. I just want to remind you that it's Aaron Wood, once more that extermination of an enemy is something extraordinary. When one's thought, things, and will are concentrated on one thing, on destruction, then the nature of the heart also changes. When war becomes everyday ex existence, it disintegrates, it dies. This is the verdicts of, of chroniclers of the everyday. When they want to describe war, 
as a shock worker successes or a colpos vagent. War demands not so much to be described as to be supported, not ink, but something flammable. A writer's duty is to fan the flames of indignation, alarm, and self-sacrifice. One would be hard to press to more precisely understand and formulate the aesthetics and poetics of, of wartime literature. It would be difficult to name a more straightforward form of mass education than um, wartime poetry. Among the numerous texts of Soviet literature of this period, it would be equally difficult to find a more strongly influential text than Konstantin Simonov's poem, Kill Him, Obey Him. The poem was published in Pravda in July 1942, at the most desperate moment of the war, on the eve of the Battle of Stalingrad. The poem became part of one of the films in the Marshall Cinema Collection, Bayevi uh, Tinas Burmiki, that's uh, one of these um, uh, uh, short series of, of that were shown uh, to the soldiers at, on the front. Here is Mikhail Tsaryov's rendition of the fragment of the poem. I wanted you to listen. German will, will trample the floors, will sit on the grand, uh, grandfather's table and, uh, and cut down the trees in the garden. The mother is old, her breast hasn't had milk for years. 
and she is wrinkled, but the Germans will um, uh, will um, um, yeah, and, and the arms that, that bore your uh, to the cradle will have to wash the Germans' uh, clothes and uh, make his bed. The father has died on the throne, but he will turn over in his grave when the German uh, tears down his picture in uniform before your mother's, uh, your own mother's uh, eyes, stamps on uh, his, uh, his boots on his face. Your school teacher is old, but he educated you but the German will hand him on the post. The apogee of this uh, uh, attention from what could happen is reached in a stanza about the beloved. Everything is in it. Recollection of innocence and purity of feelings. Uh, the scenes of, scene of rape. And the, finally, the appeal to strong male love. For... Um, Forthright sensuality and eroticism permeate this stanza. Everything is brought into play to affirm the main idea addressed directly to you. This pronoun is repeated 36 times in this text. All of this will inevitably uh, come to pass. Indeed, it seems it might already be happening if you do not kill the German. Simonov devotes a whole stanza, the last one, to a single idea, the full import of which boils down to the fact that you, and only you, not your neighbor, not your brother, must do the killing. You cannot escape this killing. You must not hide from it, not even behind your brother. Simonov modeled a situation of the existential inevitability of the individual in wartime through maximal humanization of the situation by making it more immediate for the reader. In this respect, the, stand, uh, the last stanza is especially striking precisely because of its accessibility to anyone. Let him die, not you. Let his house burn, not yours. Let his woman become a widow, not, your, uh, uh, widow, not yours. And only after this intense orchestration of the theme is the famous finale of the poem her. Ubey, сколько раз увидишь его, столько раз его убей. Kill each one you uh, 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 a chance to see him kill. The force of aggression in this poem is immense. The author's aggression against the reader is supposed to combine the reader's aggression against the enemy. This is what I said, this translation of hatred through the through, to, uh, transmission, transmission of, of hatred through the, uh, through the different media, like uh, uh, poetry and, and visual things, and film and uh, uh, The reader is just as much an object of aggression as the enemy. Hence, the corresponding attitude towards him, a mercilessness like that of a military tribunal, a disregard for individuality and in generalization. The next one about wife. So it's not quite clear who is the reader, the, 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 the reader or, or the listener. Yes, you know, this is beloved, probably not wife. This is why it's not beloved already. Well, it's, it's like, uh, but, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because this is not, the, indivi the, the individuality is not important. You is not a person. You are a, a killing machine. You need to kill. That's what that's, this, this whole message is all about. Um, so uh, the re recipient to him, Simonov, uh, Simonov's text is addressed, is above all an object of aggression and needs to be an instrument of vengeance. This is especially obvious in posters from the uh, early period of the war. Uh, now I'll just move to different uh, uh, media, the poster. Everywhere in them we see um, slaughtered and wounded children. 
uh, who cry out things like, Papa killed the German, avenge the tears and blood of our children, destroy the murderers of our children without mercy. And then we see destitute mothers and dishonored sweethearts who urge the troops on Red Army fighter, don't betray your beloved to shame and disgrace from Hitler's soldiers. And we see imprisoned sister, sisters begging to be free. The very same motifs are repeated in Soviet paintings. These images are so repetitive that the poster themselves ultimately become meta images, as in case of two posters, very famous posters, um, Red Army Soldiers Save Us and the Fight to, to the Death. In the second of these posters, in this one, the first one appears a peculiar, a, a peculiar backdrop. The action depicted makes reference to the source, which is, in, is this background, background image. This visual circularity leads to a semantic tautology. That is particularly obvious in painting, which for the most part continued with the range of poster images. These are, especially these two, are probably most famous uh, 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 paintings um, of the uh, 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 of the war period. Uh, and first, in, in Arkady Plastov's painting, "The German Flew Over," 1943, Nemec Prelitsyl, this one on, on the right hand side. Uh, for example, we again see a dead child. A dead child. Um, so, uh, a German plane has just flown over. We can see it somewhere at the very uh, left upper side of the, of the, of the painting. Uh, shooting the boy shepherd. The very pose of the boy and autumnal surroundings both evoke a feeling of profound melancholy. But in Sergei Gerasimov painting, the partisan's mother, also 1943, Mat Partizan, also a very famous um, wartime painting, uh, we witness a horrible execution scene that depicts simultaneously both resistance and futility. These are probably the most famous of all uh, Soviet wartime paintings. The most interesting things in these paintings, despite all the, their differences, is the preservation of the poster-like quality. As the paintings of individual painters, they evoke simultaneously an oppressive sensation of pity and, and, um, and, and grief, uh, or uh, the outrage. These images are, uh, of course, more complex, these two. Uh, but their aim is still mobilizational, and their strategy the same as it is in literature, is that of testimony. A typical in this respect is, a, is the post-war post painting by Kukriniksi, this one, uh, Testimony at the Trial. That was, it was uh, 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 painted in 1945, um, after the war, right after the war, in which it's, it's uh, sort of a uh, Nuremberg trial, uh, sort of, I'm not specifically, but, but it looks like this. Um, in these uh, visual images are set into a prosecutorial um, uh, uh, trial discourse. The wartime culture is grounded in paradox. On the one hand, it demands a peculiar, peculiar psychologism that, as we have seen, lies at the heart of the uh, persuasiveness of this text and images. On the other hand, it is anti-psychological. 
as Ilya and Burke observe, war does not allow nuances. It is built on black and white, on selfless devotion and on crime, on bravery and on cowardice, on self-oblivion and on turpitude. Anyone to whom it may occur to complicate the psychology of the enemy would knock the rival, a rifle from the hands of its own defender." End quote. The ink flows like blood, and even, I, even if I had the dismal imagination of the devil itself, wrote Alexei Tolstoy in his article The Face of Hitler's Army, I would be able to draw uh, to dream up uh, like the the uh, um, uh, 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 dream up the, the kind of uh, uh, reverseless of, of torment, mortal screams, repetitious tortures, and killings that have all become a uh, an everyday phenomenon in the in areas of the Ukraine, Belarus, and Great. Russia, where the, the fascist German hordes have invaded. This dismal imagination of the devil himself emerges into, um, immerses us uh, into a world of sadomasochistic mysteries in which the depiction of scene of violence predominates. Some, such scenes uh, constituted the basis of the poetics of wartime literature and art. Short stories and epic poems, paintings and posters, especially in the earlier period of the war, are full of imagery of unbelievable violence and horrible scenes, un un unspeakable uh, uh, tortures, and, 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 and these scenes are, you know, especially these mass persecutions and, and you know, children's testimony. Well, you all know, of course, uh, you know, stories about you know, the, the, the torture and, 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 and all this. So, so it was all um, very much a part of, of, um, of a uh, uh, wartime culture. I, I, I actually wanted to uh, finish my, my presentation with the, with the uh, uh, very famous film of Mark Danskoy, uh, The Rainbow, uh, Radoga, uh, the, the uh, novel written by Wanda Vasilevskaya. Uh, uh, it, it's absolutely a uh, 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 horrifying uh, uh, story. Uh, it's about you know uh, pregnant parts a pregnant partisan um, Alena, whose child was killed. She gave birth, and, and the child was killed, and her murder. I mean, the absolutely horrific naturalistic uh, 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 story itself, um, and then film. Uh, a, a film of um, uh, Mark Danskoy's film, uh, which is based on, on Vasilevsky's story. I, I have no time for it now. Uh, but the film was brutally and naturalistically told the story of unbelievable suffering and death of the pregnant partisan, Elena uh, Kostyuk. Uh, the role was played by a, a, a great Ukrainian actress, Natalia Ushvi, a very famous um, actress. Uh, it, it became a classic of, by the way, be, this film became, became a classic of not, not only Soviet cinema, but also, also world cinema, because it, it, had, it was very influential on Italian uh, neorealism. And um, uh, uh, this is absolutely amazing film, well, in the story itself and in the film, um, you know, which, of course, you can uh, watch. I think it's available nowadays. You can watch everything on YouTube. So. Um, but but um, this is a, a classic of, of, of uh, definitely a word for a time period. Um, okay, uh, so I'm uh, going to uh, uh, finish with, um, um, with some... Um, okay, this is for conclusion. Okay, Soviet wartime culture is more than anything else a whole symphony of hatred. It is, uh, in it, the principal theme was richly orchestrated. It has a wealth of sophisticated key changes, and the instrumentation was brief. In 1943, Ilya Ehrenburg penned an article with the typical title, the title of it, With His Blood, Yevokrovi. 
In it, he reproduced some fragments of the letter by the fallen German officer, Karl Peters. They described the war and relate how Peters burned villages, raped and killed Russians. Ehrenberg concluded, and I quote, I will repeat the words, I was in March 43, this sounds. I will repeat the words spoken in the most horrific days of last summer, the summer 1942, during, uh, just prior to Stalingrad battle, the, 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 probably the most uh, 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 difficult period of, of, of the war. Uh, most horrific days of the last summer. Kill. Kill Karl Peters. Kill a German. He must not remain alive. The earth doesn't want to harbor villains. Kill a German so that he won't burn another hundred villages. Kill a German to save thousands of innocent people. Kill a German for everything he has done and for everything he wants to do. Kill a German if your son was killed. Kill a German if your son is alive. A German will try to kill him. If Karl Peters has not killed your son, remember this. Karl Peters will have a son, and his son will become a grinder, a murderer. Let's make sure Karl Peters has no son. Everyone who actually loves humanity, all true humanists, all genuine peace-loving people, will all tell you, go there, into brigands' nest, into the land of cannibals, to kill Karl Peters. To his cows, uh, there you will find redemption. There, their justice will write its sentence by iron, by fire, and blood. Kill Karl Peters today. Kill him. Your conscience demands it. He must not escape. There is more than one way to grow roses and nurse children. But what will calm down your enraged conscience? Only one thing, his blood. This text requires no particular comments. It is purely anti-German material. Characteristically, the class internationalist rhetoric is not simply absent. It is explicitly rejected. So all this Soviet ideology is simply not here. It's just purely, you know, anti german national, you know, discourse. Nothing else. In Soviet wartime culture, the authorities, the masses, and art all stood face to face in this humanized nakedness without any ideological fame, uh, uh, face painting. And this is precisely when the, uh, the pre-war alienation of art from the regime and the mass was overcome. The circumstances of the war forced art and literature for, for, for perhaps the first time ever to briefly depart from the hollowed socialist realist conventions. With the wartime affectation, the regime and the masses began to speak with a new human voice. For a short while, art suddenly ceased to be a simple ritual. The horrifying and threatening reality of the war burns mightily into it. It was a triumph of the estrangement. I mean, the word estrangement in, in formalist, uh, you know, yeah, astranging. This reality succeeded in making the socialist realist canon something strange, something unfamiliar. It was not art that made love, uh, uh, life strange. On the contrary, life made art strange. This estrangement was like an eruption, abrupt and unexpected. Life in its most brutal forms for a brief time, cut through the fog of Stalinism. When the war ended, or even as 
it was still drawing to the to a close. Stalinism came back to the aesthetic conventions of 1930s within in the Zhdanov era were even more intensified. Nevertheless, despite the policy of replacing war with victory in the late Stalinist era, the war experience remained in Soviet culture forever. It became a constant reminder that behind the aestheticized facade of Stalinism, there exist existed a reality that through its horror and, and at least once broken through this facade. A decade afterwards, in the post-war, uh, post-Stalin era, a new truth about the war in literature, film, and painting uh, would begin to enter in this breach. It would constantly make use of the images of violence, suffering, and victimization, the so-called Vajena Prosa, 60s, 70s, and all of them, um, uh, uh, referring to these images of violent suffering and victimization, and the film, of course, but not only literature, film as well, uh, it's important, uh, that we find in wartime culture. It is just this ex uh, existential experience that would become the core of not only late Soviet memory, but also post Soviet historical consciousness. The latter is entirely based on reference to the war and the victory. This experience was needed again at the time um, that the heroic Soviet era ended in um, the bitterness of historic defeat in the Cold War, when the national psyche triumph, uh, um, uh, traumatized by the breakdown of empire needed a new identity. This new identity is based on hybrid of greatness and self-sacrifice, of heroism and suffering, a combination of persecution complex and delusions of grandeur. The, the, an everyday uh, life permeated with violence requires more justification and historicization. This is especially true when no um, uh, unquestionably positive event in the 20th century Russian history, except victory in the war remains. Uh, and the greatness of this victory is the bedrock of the state ideology of contemporary Russia. So when the one uh, um, contemplates the political discourse in Russia over the last decades, when one examines post-Soviet and uh, art and history, and when one looks at contemporary Russian cinema, then one will understand that the art of hatred is almost the only aspect of the political aesthetic practice of Stalinism that is still relevant today. Thank you.